Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And we have part three of our story about Ken McElroy today. Thank God. I really need to hear the, like, conclusion <laughs> of this. I honestly do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I also read the book In Broad Daylight by Harry N. McLean, and I watched the six-part series of No One Saw a Thing. And... um. I just watched that online, so I'll link that in our show notes. Okay. So a little recap of part two. Um, We were talking about how the town of Skidmore decided to stand up for themselves. They had a town meeting and decided they would all keep an eye on Ken McElroy for the next 10 days while they waited for the hearing. But things didn't work out the way that they intended. Ken showed up in town as the meeting was ending, and he was shot and killed by at least two people, maybe three. There were about 40 to 50 witnesses standing around the truck when Ken was shot, but they all said that they didn't see anything. Ken's wife, Trina, had been sitting in the truck next to him when he was murdered, and she said that Del Clement was one of the shooters. There were a few different theories tossed out by the townspeople. They saw men in suits that were there on the day of the shooting. Maybe it was them. Or it could be Ken's mobster friends from Kansas City. Perhaps it was the sheriff, Danny Estes. The investigation began and everyone kept repeating that they didn't know who killed Ken and they didn't want to know. The KMA radio station mentioned that the whole town was responsible for killing Ken. And they used the word vigilante. That's when everyone heard about the small community that killed the town bully, and it spun into a national story. And that is where we ended in the last one. And let's not forget he got shot right in the dirty button (laughs) two episodes ago. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. It just brings me happiness every time I think about it, okay? I can't help it. Yeah, (laughs) that was in the first one. Don't mind me. (laughs) The community had originally tried to protect Trina, and they had sympathy for her after Ken had been murdered. If Ken was able to intimidate a whole town, of course he could intimidate his wife. Unfortunately, they really changed their minds about her when she kept running her mouth to the newspapers, and she said the town was making stuff up about him. She said, quote, he was a good-hearted person. He'd help anyone that needed to be helped. He Uh, was good to his kids and good to me. This is a much different story. It really is. Than everybody else. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just saying. And she was asked, they were like, okay, Trina, so what about all the bad things that Ken had been accused of? And she said, quote, they're making most of it up. He was just a man who would stand up for his rights. Um, stand up for the rights that he made up and decided were his rights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was uh, kind of taking charge of the town. And then Trina denied that Ken had ever harmed her and said, quote, I was not a victim. We loved each other very much. I've heard those stories, too, about how he threatened my stepdad with a shotgun and burned his house down to get them to let me marry him. It's all lies. Uh, oh, Okay. And then she said that he never stole anything from anybody either. Oh, boy. Yeah. So total denial here. Yeah. That's like past denial. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, it's hard because I have to guess that she, well, we know she was a victim because either way, no matter what. Trina was the one that Ken was taking off of the school bus when she was young. Right, and well, and she was young when she got with him. Yes, she was way underage, and he was taking her to a motel. So that really does shape a lot of things. He had quite a lot of time to groom her into believing what he wanted her to also. Yeah. So I can see why the town would be pissed, like, that Trina isn't on their side with this whole thing. But... I mean, yeah, he did have a lot of time with her, you know? Ken's daughter, Tammy, also defended his actions. She said, quote, All my life, they've blamed him for everything. He was the best father anyone could have. I worshipped the ground he walked on. 
He took care of his family and loved us all. I don't know how anyone could shoot him down in cold blood. Oh, yeah. See, this is also a hard one, too, because though, like, I know that he um wasn't a great father. I think that when you're a child, you don't see so many things. Mm-hmm. And you take that, like, any attention you'll get and almost turn it into good attention. You know what I mean? So it's kind of hard with that. Well, and people can, you know, be, um, like, totally split with their personalities. Like, he's showing one side of himself to right. the town, but maybe to his kids, he's not doing that. Well, and that's what I'm saying, especially because when you're a kid, you don't see that, like, you don't always see that awful side of things that are happening. Yeah. And especially when he's as smart as he is and can, I'm sure he hides it. I mean. Absolutely. Yeah, with all the other effort he's put into all this shit. So it's just really hard for that situation, too, because it's like, how much did she actually know or see, though? Yeah, and the, his kids that did speak in the documentary, they all had, like, good things to say about him. They did not understand why the town hated him so much. That is crazy. hmm Investigators worked this case as much as they could, but Sergeant Rhodes explained that there had been 90 leads and 90 dead ends. They had been calling the investigator team Namus but they disbanded the group and turned over the files to the sheriff. Trina sent a letter to the FBI, so they stepped in after Namas stopped. Trina and Ken's lawyer, McFadden, were saying that officials had conspired to kill Ken and that deprived him of his civil rights. The government conducted a small investigation to see if Ken's civil rights had truly been violated. But they ended up expanding this into a full field investigation. The town was flabbergasted. Where was all this help when they were being tormented for so Thank long? Thank you. Thank you. That is what I was saying in the last one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they're like, what the shit is going on here? And I love that they're like, oh, his rights were violated. I'm sorry. What about every fucking buddy else's rights that he violated? If everyone had stepped up like this in the beginning, things would not have escalated this far. So different. Yeah. Prosecutor David Baird had a really interesting problem on his hands. He fully understood that the town felt that Ken got what he deserved, but he had an oath to uphold. And Trina was clearly stating that Del Clement was one of the shooters. But the 30 to 40 witnesses were not talking. Okay, but where the fuck was that oath to uphold before? (laughs) Why is it all of a sudden now? I just don't get it. I know. Well, and again, it's like, it's because this blew up. I know, but it's infuriating to listen to because it's like, again, they could have contacted other counties for help before it blew up. If you would have done your job correctly from the jump, (gasps) this wouldn't have happened. (sighs) <sighs> Gotta breathe over here. Okay? I need to breathe. <laughs> I'm getting those strawberry spins again. Oh, man. <laughs> I knew they were coming back. <sighs> In Missouri, the law required that a coroner's jury be impaneled whenever a death occurred under suspicious circumstances. The coroner's jury must determine if the death occurred in an unlawful manner. Then they need to name the person responsible if possible. If they named somebody, that person must be immediately arrested and an indictment filed. If they name no one, the case goes back to prosecutor David Baird. Eleven days after the murder, the coroner's jury met. Several witnesses testified, but they all said they did not see who the shooter was. Trainer, uh, Trainer. <laughs> I needed that. I really, really needed that. (laughs) Trainer. Aw, Trainer. Thank you. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I needed a break in my frustration. There you go. (laughs) I'll always trip on my words for you. (laughs) Thank you. It's always appreciated. Trina was the final witness and stuck to her story that Del Clement was the shooter. The jury deliberated for 27 minutes and they I came you were back. I say seconds, dude. I was like, holy <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Jeez. But 27 minutes is really fast, that too. That is really fast. Um, and they came back with a verdict. 
Ken Rex McElroy had died from a felony committed by a person or persons unknown. Prosecutor David Baird made it clear that there was absolutely no evidence of a conspiracy or vigilante act, but the news sources clung to this narrative because it was just far more interesting. The prosecutor had to decide if they should file criminal charges, but here's the problem. The coroner's jury did not name Del Clement as the shooter, and they only needed to determine that there was reason to believe that a person committed a crime. If they didn't have a reason to believe it, how on earth could they take this to trial and get a jury to find guilt beyond reasonable doubt? Like, you can't do that. If you think the town went back to normal after Ken's death, you would be wrong. I didn't feel like it was going to go back to normal anyways after all the shit they put up with. Yeah. I feel like it's a little difficult to... (laughs) Yeah. There were so many rumors swirling around afterwards. Ken had many children, and they were obviously really upset about his murder, So all of his family members started showing up to the local bank, and they started closing their accounts. And a friend of Ken's received a note in the mail that said, This is the only warning you will get. Our bellies are full of your kind. Ken did not pay any attention to leave the county when told to. Get out of this territory while you can. You have been warned. We don't want any thieves or rustlers or troublemakers. Wow. And that was turned over to the sheriff, so we do know that that letter went out, but we don't know who sent it. Okay. And so it's like, now, you know, is everybody going to start being targeted? You know, is this whole town going to just start going against anyone that they want? I mean... That's not good. It's... It's again, it's difficult. I know. Because it's like they've been through so much. Yeah. Of course they're going to be on edge. Mm Mm-hmm. And want to, like, I mean, they didn't stick up for themselves the first time around because they couldn't. Right. And so it's like now they've probably got it in their head, like, we have to stick up for ourselves immediately to prevent anything like this ever happening again. Yeah, just shut it down right away. So it is a really shitty situation. I know, the whole thing, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> can you imagine how fast rumors can spread in that in that town? Right, because, when you've got, like, like, 400 to 450 yeah. people? Oh, my God. I mean... 100 percent like when i was when i was in high school you know i went to a very small high school yeah you did and literally there was i remember this so vividly because there was a fight and i had witnessed it and it was like the only fight in the entire like time i went there because it was (laughs) such a small school okay And, and i witnessed this fight and then i'm not even kidding i went to first hour and by the time i was it was as the bell was ringing okay i go to first hour by the time i come out of first hour Every single person in the whole school knew about it. And Mm. I was like, we were in class. Yeah. (laughs) How the hell did every single person find out about this within an hour? Right. And I'm not even kidding. It was everybody. Mm. Like, the, like, uh, the, uh, not students, I almost said students, but the teachers actually had to tell the students, like, we're not going to talk about this anymore. And that was just in the second hour. That's going like, to make us want to talk about it more. Dude, I know, right? <laughs> that's like, not helpful. That's how fast it spread there. Yeah. So I can't freaking imagine how much damage could be done in mm-hmm. a small town like that when you could just literally walk next door and spread it on down. Exactly. And play a game of telephone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it only sparked, so like once this letter was received, this only sparked more suspicion of a vigilante group. There was also some rumors that Ken's oldest son, Jerome, was going to head to town from California with a bunch of motorcycle buddies to avenge his father's death. Now, Jerome did have plans to show up in town, but that was for the funeral, and his aunt actually asked him not to come. Um, Because she just didn't trust what was going on in the town. Yeah. So let's discuss the grocery store shooting where Ken shot Bo. Okay. Ken had been charged, tried, and found guilty of the crime. Since the motion for a new trial hadn't been filed yet, a judgment couldn't be entered by the court. Since the case was still alive, that meant that it could be dismissed, and if it was dismissed, the records would be sealed. 
The town heard about the case being dismissed and the records being closed on the radio. It was another slap in the face. The case against Ken had been thrown out since he had been murdered, so he was no longer guilty of second-degree assault for shooting Bo, which, like, might sound like it's not a big deal. No, it does sound like it's a big deal, actually. Yeah, because it's like, even though he's dead, this is another thing. He got off. He got away with it. He doesn't have that charge anymore. When it makes... If they were to find somebody else guilty for killing him, it makes them look worse because now those charges have been dropped on him, on Uh Ken. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And so it's like now they're sitting there going, oh, my God, was this all for nothing? Like, here we are again in the same exact position. And he's not even here anymore. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. On September 25th, the final day of the grand jury session, Prosecutor Baird announced that the grand jury would not be issuing any indictments for the murder of Ken McElroy. The grand jury heard 45 witnesses in more than eight days of testimony, and they did not find probable cause to return an indictment. The prosecutor criticized the press during his speech, and he said, quote, I think the major misconception has been the idea that it was some sort of vigilante killing, a killing by a town, so to speak. The point of view many papers have taken from the very beginning is the vigilante type killing. That is one area where we've disagreed. The idea that it was a vigilante killing makes a nice story, but I simply feel there's no evidence to confirm that. Every time you say vigilante, I'm picturing um ninja turtles so there's that oh i love that (laughs) it's literally because in the ninja turtle movie they say it like a bunch of times in the beginning (laughs) and every single time you say it like they like pop in my head you're just seeing turtles i am perfect i'm in spinning in strawberries and seeing turtles man i don't know if i'm okay right now (laughs) i'll send help (laughs) you might need to When the grand jury failed to indict, it forever marked Skidmore as the town that killed the town bully. The media portrayed it as the entire town going in to testify that they didn't see anything because they were all in on this vigilante justice. A Kansas City paper called it a, quote, planned execution that threatened the, quote, destruction of the system of government we fought for 200 years to maintain. Okay. The bullet that killed McElroy was a direct hit at the basis of democracy. Fought 200 years to maintain it when you don't do shit when everybody's (laughs) asking for help and then you get mad when people do something about it. Uh Uh-huh. As time went on, our story... Our story? It's not ours. (laughs) Oh my god. Are you... Do I need to send help to you? Yeah! (laughs) Maybe maybe our listeners just need to send help to both of us, because I'm not sure either of us are okay at this point. (laughs) As time went on, the story became taboo in Skidmore. No one talked about what happened, and if an outsider brought it up, it was shut down immediately. Festival, a band, was touring after the release of a tape called Just Another Band from Skidmore. And during their performance, people would always yell out, Who shot McElroy? Oh, God. And at first, the band really, like, played into this. They thought it was funny, so they would all raise their hands and they'd be like, I did! And then it got fucking annoying. Kind of like sing Freebird. Freebird! (laughs) Every damn show, somebody in the audience doesn't matter. It it has to happen no matter what. And it was like funny the first time, but Uh the like last 3,000 times, not as funny. The thing is, is I think most of the people yelling Freebird truly don't even know what that song is. No, they don't, because honest to God, they like, don't want them to play anything it. else, and they would be, and you could say, all right, here's Freebird, and they would think that that's what it is. You could be playing Freebird. Yeah. And somebody would still say, play yeah. Freebird. <laughs> that's true. Like, nobody knows. <laughs> and they would regret their choices, because it's like freaking 10 minutes long. Right. <laughs> Um, so the band ended up, you know, dropping the little Skidmore bit because it just got too out of hand. It was ridiculous. Yeah. The FBI did end up launching a full investigation of the case, and they interviewed more than 100 witnesses and issued 60 subpoenas to appear in front of the federal grand jury in Kansas City. 
The FBI agents tried to fit in with the town, so they dressed up as farmers and wore overalls, scuffed up boots, and wrinkled shirts, Shut like up. thinking that they were all, you know. <laughs> the, are you serious? Yes. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> um. So they like really thought they were nailing it. They're fitting in here. Uh, the town. It's a town of like three hundred people. They all know each other, <laughs> right? And the town thought this was like super laughable because they're like, okay, well, farmers don't have soft hands. It is laughable. <laughs> so yeah. Nothing. Farmers don't have soft hands. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, they're not truly. wrong. <laughs> they're not wrong at all. It's just, right. that's amazing. So it's like they come in wearing these outfits and it's like, And they're like, no, no we don't care about your outfit. Your fucking <laughs> hands aren't so- or are too soft, so yeah. we know. <laughs> yeah, let's see. You start shoveling some of that manure and then we'll talk about oh, this. That's great. Well, nothing came of this investigation and there were not any charges. Well, I wonder why. Right. Trina and Alice really clung to each other during a lot of this mess, and they wanted to make sure that their children grew up together, but they did end up severing ties. According to Alice, Ken had always said that he wanted to give his Chevy to his son Juarez, and Trina initially agreed to this, but then later changed her mind. Alice was also under the impression that she was entitled to some of the money that Trina had received for the photos of Ken in People magazine, but that did not happen. About 10 months after the killing, Trina called Alice and said that she was with a new man and he wanted her to have nothing to do with her or her children anymore. Oh. So he was just like cutting her off from, I guess, her past is what I'm taking it as. Yeah. So Trina married Howard J, but for some reason, there was always a rumor that she actually was with Ken's lawyer. Oh my god. Now, they both denied it, but it does make a good story, (laughs) you know? I mean, it sure does. (laughs) In the fall of 1982, the farmhouse where Ken lived had burned down. Some neighbors claim that they saw lightning strike the building in the middle of the night, which, (laughs) okay. And by morning, only the stone foundation and a few outbuildings remained. Honestly, I'm just going to go with it. Well, and um, the sheriff just went with it, too. Yep. So, uh, apparently, since nobody filed a complaint, the sheriff did not have to do an investigation. Sounds good. Lightning hit it. Yep. Lightning hit it. That's all. On July 9th, 1984, one day before the three-year statute of limitations would expire, oh, no. Trina filed lawsuits in Shut state up. and federal courts against the county of Skidmore, no. Nottoway County, Danny Estes, Steve Peter, and Del Clement for the death of her husband. Oh, my God. And I'll tell you, the town was so blown away because they didn't even know that this was possible. And here they are three years later. Well, I'm blown away because I, like, hear she's getting cut off from everything. So I definitely did not see that coming. Mm -hmm. She alleged that the defendants had knowingly violated Ken's civil rights and she sought three million in damage. Oh. (laughs) Oh, wow. I know. So three million in damages. In the state court, she charged the defendants with the wrongful death of her husband and an assault upon herself and sought six million, including two million for loss of support services and companionship, three million in punitive damages due to the reckless nature of the acts, and one million for pain and suffering. How much altogether? Um, okay, so um altogether she wanted fifteen million. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god. God! Um. <laughs> Whoa! And this is in the that, 80s. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> that is. Well, I mean, she's. Wow. Yeah. She, she's already got some, like, balls going in there filing that, but for that, that much? Mm hmm. Whoa! Well, and this, of course, just blasted the town right back into the spotlight. You just blasted me right back into my strawberry. (laughs) 
In February of 1985, Trina provided her deposition, and in the book, it was described as a total disaster. She wasn't sure of basic information. She was plain wrong about many things, and she was contradicting herself. The only thing that was the same from her previous testimony was that Del Clement was the one that killed her husband. Yeah, because it's three fucking years later. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to push this out of her mind, you know, to be with the new dude. Right. And it's like, you're not going to remember what your lies were. And, you know, being in such a traumatic situation, I know that you can shut down a lot of things in your brain. So it's possible that that's what happened, too. Yeah. You know, because you got to, like, go in survival mode. She said that she had lied under oath about the rape, arson, and molestation charges against Ken McElroy when she was younger, but she insisted that she was not lying now. She said that he absolutely never raped her. She made that up because he was still seeing his wife and she was just jealous. She also said that he never burned down her parents' home. It was actually faulty wiring that caused it to go up in flames. That would be real ironic timing. It's funny, I was just going to say the same exact thing. Yeah. that I mean, that would be a little too ironic. Uh Uh-huh. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? I do. (laughs) Well, I mean, I don't think a lot, but I I am right now. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) She just wouldn't have been a good witness if this went to trial. You know, she's so back and forth. Right. After her deposition, Trina decided she did not want to go through with the lawsuits any longer, so she did ask for it to be dropped. She was working with Ken's lawyer, McFadden, and he felt that they had a strong chance at winning a substantial settlement, so he told Trina that the money could go to all of Ken's children. She was working with the lawyer, huh? Uh, yeah. (laughs) Um, But she said no. Trina eventually agreed to let him try to obtain an out-of-court settlement. The lawsuit was settled, and Trina received $17,500 from the defendant. Oh, my God! (laughs) Oh, my God! (laughs) I know. It's much better than what she was asking. That's a lot of fucking money still, dude! Yeah. Holy shit! Nottaway County paid twelve thousand five hundred. Del Clement paid three thousand, and the town of Skidmore paid two thousand. Which to me, it's kind of interesting that Skidmore is the one that has to pay the right? least amount. But okay. So, like I said, you know, she originally wanted fifteen million, but ended up with a whopping total of seventeen thousand five hundred in the end. The amount that they paid was like far less than the legal fees would have been. And the witnesses did not have to testify again or face the possibility of losing. So this really was a win for them to just, like, get this settled and and get get it 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 out of there. Yeah. Yeah. In the documentary called No One Saw a Thing, a Skidmore resident, Britt Small, said, quote, That was the one mistake that they made was that they didn't kill his wife. I would have killed his wife. I probably would have ambushed him in his driveway. I would have waited for him in the cornfield, let him have it in his driveway, and then I would have set his house on fire. I would have burned everything. I'm sure a lot of people were feeling like that. I'm sure. Yeah. And of course, when Trina's like going to the newspapers and all the media outlets over and over and over, they're probably like... Yeah, why didn't we just get her too? Right. I'm glad they didn't. Yeah. But I'm sure that some of them were feeling that way. Questions still remain. How could an entire town keep things quiet for so long? Like, typically, things fall apart really fast in a murder case if there's one witness. Like, we see it all the time. But a whole town? Did they all witness it? Who knows? Everyone had a motive, and I think that that's part of the problem. Yep. Every single person had a motive to go after Ken. And and that's the thing, and because they all, literally all of them had that motive, whoever yeah. finally did it, they're probably like, fuck yeah, thank you. Right. I didn't have to be the one to do it. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, like I was saying, I think I said it last episode, it's like talking to a bunch of people in jail. You're not going to get the fucking answer you want. You're yeah. just going to get, nobody saw anything. Uh-huh. And that's exactly what they did. Several people have said that they know exactly who shot Ken in the back, but they know to keep their mouths shut if they want to stay alive. The violence and misfortune did not stop 
after Ken was murdered, and some people believe that the town is cursed. Most small towns don't see quite as much tragedy as this one has. In fact, the story about Ken McElroy may have launched the town into the media, but this isn't the first time they were accused of a vigilante-type act. So, I see your face. You're like, what? I am. <laughs> Did not see that coming. Um, So, we're going to talk about some other cases that tie into the town. And this is why people think that the town is cursed. So, the first one is Raymond Gunn, who lived in Nottoway County. On January 12, 1931, in Maryville, Missouri, Raymond Gunn was burnt to death on a schoolhouse after a mob took him from police custody. Raymond was a black man who was accused of murdering a young schoolteacher, Velma Coulter, on December 16th of 1930. She was discovered dead inside the school by her neighbors, and she had stayed late to decorate the classroom oh. for Christmas. Oh, no. I know. I was like, oh, you poor thing. She had been badly beaten, and the townspeople were furious. Some witnesses came forward and accused Raymond Gunn and said that he had an argument with Velma the day prior. He had a bad reputation around town, and he was an ex-convict that had already been convicted of an assault against a student. Okay, and, and what year was this? Um, It was in 1931. Oh, damn. Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah. You, you know where I'm going with this. Uh-huh. It doesn't help, for sure, that a lot of people were a lot more racist back then. Absolutely. Um, And that certainly does play into this. Uh, yeah, I figured. He was interrogated for several days and finally confessed, even though the evidence didn't really point to him. After he was accused of the crime, he spent a month in police custody, but he was moved several times because there was a threat against his life and they were waiting for the trial to begin. He was returned to Maryville for his indictment, and the police basically handed him over to the angry mob and watched as they hauled him away to his death. Wonderful. We still don't even know if he was guilty of Velma's death or not. Really, the police in this town need to be, like, yeah, replaced I know. by somebody that actually cares. cares. Yeah. So when the sheriff arrived, he pulled into the middle of the mob. Like, this, there's no way this wasn't a setup. Right. He pulled into the middle of the mob. What did you think was going to happen when you did that? The mob grabbed Raymond, put a rope around his neck, and dragged him to the Garrett schoolhouse oh where Velma had been murdered. They brought him to the roof of the school. They cut holes oh and God. hung his legs through. This is awful. It's so bad. They chained him up, poured gasoline over him and Dude. the school, and started the building on fire. That's like overkill right. as fuck. Yeah. And the thing was, is like, he, again, he hadn't even gone through the trial, and this would never be okay anyways, regardless of the situation or the outcome, but he hadn't even gotten, ha you know, go through his yeah. trial yet, and they just decided he was the one. That is so awful. Mm hmm Men, women, and children witnessed and participated in this lynching. A mother reportedly held her child up so that they could have a better view. Stop. No. That's disgusting. That is fucking disgusting. <laughs> it's like... I, I We always talk about this, how I know that back in the day, people used to go witness I know, this stuff. But it, I get it. But I don't. But to hold your child... Well, I don't get why they did it. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I get that this was a thing. But to hold your child up and be like, hey, I want you to have a better view of this person that's being murdered. Are you out of your damn mind? There's no time that this would be, like, acceptable. My mind can't even comprehend. No. When photographers showed up, the townspeople broke their cameras so that no members of the mob would be exposed. Reporters had questioned Sheriff England, and he said... He, quote, contemplates no action against leaders of the mob unless ordered to do so by higher authorities. So there you go. He's not going to do anything about it. Yeah, surprise, surprise. He said he was aware of several members of the mob, but he didn't reveal their names and allowed them to remain anonymous. 
I don't need. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's all I got. So when I was like researching this part, I thought, you know, you can't witness something like this or be part of it and not have some type of psychological damage. Like you just can't. Yeah. That damage gets ingrained in your DNA and can pass down for generations. So this legacy of vigilante violence was passed down, and this was the ancestors of the people involved in Ken's death. Oh, my God. How weird is that? This is... That it happened before. I'm often spinning in space right now, so... <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so then we have another story that happened in this town. Oh, good. On October 16th, 2000. This one better not fucking involve the cops. Uh, not really. Okay. Greg Dragu murdered his girlfriend, Wendy Gillenwater. Oh, this one's brutal, you guys. The last, the, the one, last one was super brutal, too. Uh, by stomping and beating her to death. Oh, my God. Greg was on a methamphetamine high, and he beat her with a flashlight. He broke eight of Wendy's ribs on one side and six on the other. There were lacerations all over her face and arms. At some point, Greg actually drug her body down the stairs and outside into the yard. The neighbor saw this, and he didn't care. He kept going. Wendy was bleeding everywhere, and nobody came to help her. As she was taking her last breaths, he poured... Dawn dish soap and water down her throat. Oh she died of severe damage to her chest and stomach. Some internet sleuths found evidence suggesting that she was also dragged around Skidmore, hanging from his car until she died. I don't so, ever want to fucking go near this town. That's the thing. Like, there's no way that people didn't see. And we already know the neighbors saw this going down, like, in the yard. And if she was dragged behind a vehicle, she absolutely was seen by people. It is very scary that the whole town, like... Nobody did anything! Yeah. More than once now. And she was so mangled that her mother was only able to identify her by the rings on her hand. That is so horrific. And Greg had been beating Wendy for years, and nobody in town said anything. Like, they knew about it. Greg is serving a life sentence at the Western Missouri Correctional Center in Cameron, Missouri. We do also have a disappearance in the town. On April 11, 2001, 20-year-old Branson Perry disappeared. On the day of the disappearance, he went out to a shed to put away some jumper cables and never returned. His father was in the hospital, so he was cleaning up and getting ready for him to come home. His van and all his belongings were left behind. One of the weirdest things is that he specifically said he was bringing the jumper cables to the shed before the disappearance, but the jumper cables were never found until two weeks later. What? Mm-hmm. So they were found in plain sight, hanging in the shed by the front door. Like, could not miss it hanging right there when you go in. The police said the jumper cables were not there when they originally checked. There's a rumor in town that Brandon, or Branson, whoops, <laughs> was murdered and fed to the hogs. Whoa! Mm-hmm. There's a few rumors with this one. One suspect is Jack Wayne Rogers, a former Presbyterian minister. He admitted to killing the, quote, blonde-haired man from Skidmore in an online chat room, and he ended up in prison for child pornography. Gotta love when it's the minister. Oh, God. It's so scary. It's, like, just extra scary. It is. In the chat room, Jack Rogers went by the name Buggerbutt. <laughs> so, here's how the conversation <laughs> <laughs> How do I even respond to that? I don't think you do. <laughs> um, here's how the conversation went, and I'll just say anonymous for the other person that's involved in this chat. Anonymous, you gotta tell me the whole thing from start to finish. I'm most intrigued. Bugger butt. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would break you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it was the way you casually said 
<laughs> Bugger butt. That's just gonna be hard to get through. Ugh. Okay. Okay. Well, the conversation's real gross. Okay. Good. Well, that'll Not definitely. Good. Well, it'll definitely help me get through this a little better. Okay. The boy was from Skidmore. He was hitchhiking when I picked him up, tied it to a tree with its legs spread, prepared a steak for it. Never mind, I hate it. Mm Mm-hmm. Anonymous. Did it talk and scream? Oh my god, I fucking hate it. Bugger butt. Screamed nicely. It broke emotionally and started crying like a baby, begging and pleading. Anonymous. Did it beg you to take the steak out? Oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I don't want to hear this anymore. Nope, that's the last of that part. Okay. (laughs) This conversation allowed police to launch an investigation and get a search warrant for his home. During the search, they found a leather necklace with a turtle's claw on it, and Branson's father said it belonged to his son. Later, it was discovered that this was not his necklace. He actually had one very similar. Is that a thing? I guess. Turtle claws? Yeah, I had no idea. I don't know. That feels weird. It does. Yeah. It's not something. I mean, like, I guess I've heard of, like, the shark tooth and stuff. But I've never heard a turtle claw? Yeah. I don't know. Huh. Maybe. But, yeah, for it to, like, he had one similar. Like, it must be a thing from there. Because there's multiple. Yeah. Wow. All right. In the documentary, they discussed the horrifying rumor about what happened to Branson. There is a rumor that he was tied to a tree naked, a stake was pushed through his genitals, and his genitals were cut off and eaten in front of him while he was still alive. Even though this matches up with some of the information from the chat room conversation, Jack said that he made this all up based off the information he was hearing in the media. I fucking hope so. Yeah. Jack Wayne was also charged for cutting off someone's genitals for real. Oh, my God. Both he and a Boy Scout leader decided to do a makeshift gender reassignment surgery in a hotel room. Oh, Oh no. It's so bad. Oh, no. And Jack Wayne Rogers performed the operation. Oh, no. He promised Madison that he could remove their genitals in a four-hour operation, but it went longer than that, and there were complications, and the bleeding wouldn't stop, you know, because he's not an actual real surgeon. He was a minister. Madison wanted the surgery and said that she originally did not feel like a victim, but changed her mind after prosecutors told her about Jack's criminal history, including child porn cannibalism allegations and they found out that he had a collection of photographs of severed genitals like this was something he was into can you imagine because she's just trying to be happy right she just wants to live her truth and now she has to find out that he's a predator oh my god i don't know how you like get your head to you know oh move through that it's so horrifying I feel so sorry for her. I hope she's, like, thriving and living her best life Yes! I really do. (laughs) There were rumors about some kind of drug involvement being the cause of Branson's disappearance, and law enforcement believed that the person responsible was from Skidmore. There was a big problem where people were making meth, and he fell into the wrong crowd. It is known that Branson was supplying the ingredients to make the drugs. He got in trouble with an officer, and it's believed that a kingpin was worried that he might start talking. Police found nine people that they think were involved, and they were all interrogated separately. Two of them pointed to the same spot on a map and said that that was where he was buried in an empty field. The police brought some dogs out, and the dogs kept hitting on one specific spot. They took the dogs and walked them out a mile and they started the process all over again and the dogs brought them back to the same spot again. Nine of the ten dogs stopped in the same location, but police were not able to find a body. Oh, so like there was probably one there at yes. some point and had been moved. That's exactly what they think because they did notice that the dirt was packed different in this specific location. So they believe that Branson's body was there, and then somebody dug it up and moved it. Again, for nine out of ten dogs. Like, come on. I'm going to believe that all day. (laughs) Yeah. 
The house where they think that he was shot was burned down before they could investigate. Rumors say that his body was cut up into little pieces and put in the water. So there's not really anything else, unfortunately. Like, we still don't know what happened to Branson. Then there's another murder, and I did read in a few places that this was a cousin of Branson Perry's. I don't know um, if she really was okay. or if it, so you know, if it's like a first cousin or maybe it's further down. Okay. 20 year or 23 year old Bobby Joe Stinnett was eight months pregnant and she was killed on December 16th of 2004. The murderer also cut her baby from her womb. Bobby Joe's mother was the one who found her, and she called 911 oh, God, and said that she looked like, quote, her stomach exploded. <gasps> oh, my God. Okay. It's so tragic. The baby is safe. Let me just. What? Yeah, the baby's safe. Let me put that the, out there right now. What? Okay, okay. <laughs> I so, did not expect that. I just want to give you that. <laughs> Um, Bobby Joe was a dog breeder, so she met Lisa online, and she claimed that she wanted to buy a terrier from her. So they were talking, and um, Lisa was well aware that Bobby Joe was pregnant. She had seen photos of her because she had been posting them. So when Lisa went to her home, she strangled Bobby Joe two to three different times. Clumps of Lisa's hair and spots of her blood were found at the scene. So Bobby Joe put up fight a back, fight. Fight yeah. back, yeah. And evidence does show that she was still fighting back even after her stomach had been cut. Oh, my God. No. Oh, my God. So luckily, the baby was found safe in Topeka, Kansas, and returned to the father. The police showed up at Lisa's home, and she was sitting there, holding the baby, and watching the news story about the murder. Oh, my no like a real no 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 uh, that no it's like so demonic come on oh, oh god it's so creepy and gross to just be sitting there holding the baby and watching it oh my god i'm i'm uh, yeah uh, mm. i'm sure that the police that walked in on that had to get like immediate therapy one hundred percent. Fuck you up. Oh my god. I'm fucked up just hearing it. Yeah. Lisa Montgomery had been lying about being pregnant, and she had done this many times before, even though she had her tubes tied nine years earlier. Like intentionally? I believe so. So why the okay, all right. Yeah. All right. I'm yep. Yeah. She called her husband and said that she had given birth, so he went and picked her and the baby up and brought them home. And I have no idea why on earth he didn't say, like, hey, you aren't supposed to be able to have kids. Like, what's going on here? He just went with it. I mean, maybe, I guess. Well, what? I mean... Okay, but what would I, what would you do like if you were if you were dating somebody or like married to somebody and all of a sudden the like um I just had a baby and you like roll up and there they are with a baby like yeah that's true it would be hard to be like no this didn't happen you know your your first thoughts are probably going to be more or less panic than how the hell did this happen it's not possible and no one wants to think that you're like that disgusting no. and able to go cut a baby out right. of somebody. So Lisa had been, like, prepping the town. She told everybody that she was pregnant. She went around and showed the baby off as soon as she got there. Like, she went to the local oh diner. Gosh, she went to the so preacher's weird. house. She wanted everyone to see, this is my new baby. She was sentenced to death by lethal injection, and that actually did take place on January 13th of 2021. Whoa. Yeah. 2021? Yeah, so that's real Holy recent. Holy shit. I know. I, I was kind of like, what? <laughs> but all this violence and negativity has really changed the entire town, and it's collapsing in on itself. The older generation has been dying, and the younger generation is moving away. 
outsiders don't really show up in the town and they're not welcome anyway. Yeah, I wonder why they don't show up. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> well, they're not welcome because they just want answers to what's going on and the town doesn't want to talk about it. Most of the people that were there on the day that Ken McElroy was killed are dead now. His wife, Trina, passed away, the sheriff died, and the man that Trina claimed was responsible, Del Clement, drank himself to death afterwards. That's sad. Mm -hmm. The community murdered a man in broad daylight, and now the town is left with a black cloud that just doesn't seem to lift. So it's just crazy that there's, I mean, seriously, in such a small town, all of this it's a murder lot. and disappearance and, like, really, really violent stories. That's crazy. It's a lot. Yeah. And and just even the fact that so many people were murdered mm -hmm. because, like, when you when you really, like, try to put it into perspective, you know, like, if you think about the town we live in, we don't, I mean, not that I know of, we don't have any murders that, like, mm -mm. have happened. No. And here their town is with more than one. And that is really freaking scary. Yeah, like, I think somebody put a um, refrigerator outside and they taped it up and we assumed that there was a body inside of it. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I don't. It was a few years ago. <laughs> um, we saw it sitting outside, like, waiting for the garbage and we were like, oh. oh, there's a body in there for sure. Oh, I assume anything like that has a yeah, body in there. Always. So it's hard for me to, like, pinpoint specific, yeah. like... Of course. Yeah. But no, I there's nothing really big. And I mean, our town is small, but definitely bigger than that. Yeah. But it's just like, it's just crazy that there's that many. Yeah. In such a small town. Yeah. So, I mean, there, some people are like, oh, it's hogwash. There's absolutely no curse here. But some of the residents do firmly believe that, yeah, there is a curse and it started with, you know, all this vigilante type stuff. Listen, curse or not, I'm not going there. Yeah, I, I'm good. I'll pass. I'm staying the hell away from that place. I want no part of it. Sorry, people, but <laughs> yeah, I am not. Nope, I'm, I'm not good. It. <laughs> I'm good on that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so that's the story. I'm just happy that we have finished it because seriously, Isaac tried to talk to me last night about um a couple cases ago that we talked about, and I don't even remember what he was saying now, but he was like. Oh, yeah, I just listened to it and this and this and this. And he was like, wasn't this like or wasn't this person doing this? And I was like, dude, I don't know. Yeah. The only thing I can focus on right now is the case we are on because uh -huh. it is embedded in my head. There's so I much think happening. about it yeah. all the time <laughs> until it is finished. And so I'm actually really happy that we are closing this out. Yeah. And then I. You know, we're, well, I can actually focus on other things again because this was like taking me over when yeah. I don't like know the conclusion. Mm -hmm. They I don't know why they just like seep into my brain and stay. They won't go away. Not until I know. Well, unfortunately, too, like we don't know who the actual shooters were and we probably no, never will. But I also was really thinking like because you kept telling me there was a curse and I had to know all about the curse. Yeah. <laughs> and so I kept like wondering what it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. And like you have no idea how many things an ADHD can like brain can come up with in such a short amount of time. It's a lot. It's a lot. But this was probably much worse than you thought it was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, because you got me there. It's like when so I um was when I was watching the documentary and they sort of briefly mentioned in one of the episodes like a curse. And I was like, what, 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 a what? <laughs> so I immediately have to start researching before I even watch the next episode because I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I am on the side that it is cursed. Yeah, I so, agree. Yep. I think that they accidentally cursed themselves. And that shit does get ingrained in your DNA and it passes down for generations. Well, and not only that, but I, you know, like objects hold on to things, you know, that's how mm -hmm. you end up with like haunted objects in a house. And so it's like, you got to imagine what that town is holding on to itself, like not the people, but the town itself. Like what yeah. kind of energy is there? No, that's true. So. Yeah. And, you know, they were kind of talking at the end, too, and saying like the town really has never been the same since yeah. all of this happened. And, um, you know, with people moving away, too, there's less and less going on. A lot of businesses have been shut down. There's not a lot of people that, you know, are out in the streets very often. Like, it's just kind of Maybe quiet. Maybe we just need to let that town fizzle out. <laughs> it probably will. 
it'll just end up being like a little blip on the map. That's and... what we need to do. Sorry, guys, but we re- <sighs> just start over. Yeah. Jump a few times over, start again. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not all together, though. Maybe maybe split we'll, yourselves apart. Yeah, we'll split up. <laughs> there we go. We solved it. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.